Greetings from Stanford University. I'm Bill Barnett, a professor at the Stanford Graduate School of Business and the Stanford Door School of Sustainability. I'm Ingrid Ackerman, a junior studying environmental systems engineering. And we have with us here today Professor Fiorenza Michelli from the Stanford Door School of Sustainability. And we just had uh, a week ago a tremendous conference on the intersection of sustainability and marine science. And uh, uh, Professor McKelly, thank you so much for making the time to come here. Thank you, Bill, and thank you, Ingrid. I'm really happy to be here. Fantastic. Ingrid, you were at the conference. Uh, what are your reactions? So this was an incredible two-day event. Um, the first day of the conference was more focused on kind of the problems in the ocean space. What can we measure? What can we quantify? What do the cutting edge scientists know right now? The second day of the conference, we kind of took what we just learned and thought about how does this relate to business and sustainability? Um, and what are some possible solutions or things that the business realm can do to help marine science? Well, that's interesting. So now we've got uh, uh, Professor McKelly here. What questions would you have for her? Sure. So from the conference, what do you think those big learnings we have are right now in marine science? Yes, so the, first of all, let me take a step back and say that the challenge that we're facing in marine science is that the whole oceans are huge. They're vast, they're deep, they're a really difficult environment to study. As a result, we, all, we know very little about the oceans. However, that has rapidly changed over the past two decades. In fact, now we have uh, lots and lots of data streams that are coming in because of technological advances. It's been called a data tsunami. We collected more data in the past 20 years than in the previous centuries in the ocean environment. So why is this important? The oceans are 70% of our planet, 90% of its habitable space. So they're a very big part of life, of our planet support system. However, they are under tremendous pressure from climate change and overexploitation of resources, pollution, and many other pressures. And so in oceans, we're facing, and as marine scientists and marine practitioners, we're facing the urgency of addressing these problems, also through ocean discovery, by understanding more about the oceans, and then at the same time to form the partnerships that will enable us to provide solutions at scale. And so this motivated the conference, really. And you now, as Ingrid, as you described, the first part was, OK, where are we at? What are we learning? How? What do we need to do to learn more and ramp up the pace and scale of learning? And then the second day was devoted to how do we make progress in terms of addressing these pressing challenges? And I would say that uh, one of the main takeaways from all this was that uh, the solutions will come from bringing together different disciplines, different skill sets, different communities. Now that it's really about partnerships, fully engaging the diversity of talent, of needs, of visions that are out there. And I think this really came across in the second day with the participation of uh, you know, speakers from the humanities, from computer science, advances in machine learning. So you know, really, one of the most exciting parts is that uh, data are important. And exploration is absolutely fundamentally important. But then the tools that will enable us to transform those data in understanding and that, that understanding into actions and solutions is where the new frontier is in ocean science. You know, that, that's very interesting, uh, uh, Theo. You know, uh, you always hear about the need for more interdisciplinary work. And you go right to that with your answer. Could you give us a specific uh, finding or takeaway or example that makes that uh, tangible for us? Yes, a couple of examples included uh, the advances in transforming uh, images, the millions of images that are collected by underwater cameras and uh, uh, remotely operated vehicle and submersible, all the way from citizen science, you know, 
people getting in the water and taking pictures from the more sophisticated uh, you know, uh, underwater vehicles. And then with the uh, advances that combined with advances in artificial intelligence and computer vision, rapidly assessing the biodiversity in oceans, leveraging these images. So going from a processes that would take armies of people working on it and years to an automation of diversity. And then another really uh, exciting example is that sometimes this flood of data and real important information comes through me means that were not designed for ocean exploration. For example, large vessels have to carry transponders to signal their position. This is for safety as an anti-collision device. And so every few minutes, we have the positions of about 70% of vessels around the world. And so now these data are available and have been used combined with advances in machine learning to quantify and track fishing activity and deep sea mining and lots of other uses of the ocean. Mm -hmm. And so now we have this picture, now the oceans were let's say, this vast unknown. Now we have this real time picture of how much of the ocean is used, not all of course, because this is for large vessels. But so these are examples of kind of the breakthrough that the speakers and the panelists and the participants in the conferences discussed. Oh, that's fantastic. So in both of those examples, it sounds like there were some partnerships between both academia and then possibly private institutions. We kind of, we touched on that at the conference. Do you mind expanding? Um, yes, so these are all examples of partnership between uh, civil society, industry, governments, academic institutions. All of these examples entail this uh, uh, partnership. What I thought was really exciting is that there was much discussion of how to bring the costs and the access down. And for example, uh, um, uh, one of the participants uh, talked about field kit. These uh, cheap sensors, you know, low cost ch sensors that they have produced, uh, that this company um, has produced to allow environmental monitoring in the ocean as well as on land, as well as the software platforms that enable access to all. So these were the, and then uh, another example was uh, Manu Prakash, so this was uh, Shah Selby from Conservif Conservify. Another example was Manu Prakash here from Bioengineering at Stanford who talked about frugal science. How to bring the capacity of microscope or plankton trackers of environmental DNA at scale by working with citizens and communities in, uh, you know, around the world to make this capacity not only uh, uh, greater, but also more accessible mm -hmm. and the responsive to the need of communities, not necessarily scientists in an academic institution here in North America, but the people on the ground that need that understanding, that need that knowledge. So I thought those were all really exciting examples. And then along these lines, there was one of the lightning talks. We had these short talks that presented kind of an advertisement of research advances. And there were a few that focused on do-it-yourself science on students and communities, including indigenous communities, that come up with their own tools and approaches to monitor things like uh, uh, seafood contamination no, and uh, health of the seafood consumed, all the way to um, the soundscapes on coral reefs, the noises that fish and crustacean make that allow us to track changes in diversity, for example. So it was a really exciting kind of portfolio of uh, ways of thinking about uh, scaling this capacity, but also making it more responsive to needs. This is, that's incredible. And so there were indigenous communities contributing new knowledge. Yes. W where were they from? So the cases that were covered were from Alaska, and uh, no, and there's other examples across the Pacific and other locations so where there's traditional knowledge and now also the integration with new knowledge acquired through these tools. 
For example, one of the projects that was discussed is a collaboration between Stanford University and uh, um, uh, the Northern Chumash tribe mm. in San mm -hmm. Luis Obispo, which has proposed uh, a new national marine sanctuary. It's called the Chumash Heritage National Marine Sanctuary to protect uh, an area of the coast here in Central California. And they are partnering with academic scientists to use environmental DNA the fragments of genetic materials that are shed by organisms in the marine environments, you know, from their skin and their secretions, to track the diversity in their proposed sanctuary. So it's an integration of traditional knowledge, what is known traditionally about those areas being corridors for movements of species, for example, with these new tools from genomics and genetics that uh, scale up and ramp up the speed at which we can understand marine biodiversity. That's incredible. So do you think it's fair to say that over the past two decades, we've rapidly increased how much we're able to learn about the marine environment, but now we're at the point where we're scaling it to make it accessible, to complete the data sets, and to integrate this knowledge with the rest of the world. Is that a fair assessment of where we are? Yes, and so yes, I think that we're seeing a true expansion, you know, an explosion of our ability to explore the ocean. But I, I think that it's important to note that perhaps the, the most important message is what is this knowledge for and for whom? And I think that this came out from the conference, mm -hmm. that you can always collect more data, you can always invest more resources in exploration, and that is very important, of course. But the breakthrough, the urgency is associated on how that information is then accessible and supporting decisions that people need to make all over the world, including a greater diversity of uh, marine scientists and practitioners in a broader definition, not only academia, and supporting decision making and solution to the grand challenges that we're facing in oceans, but really on the in the planet. Now, one of the messages is not only there's an urgency to address uh, the issues affecting oceans and ocean health and sustainable uses of oceans, but oceans hold solutions to other challenges in climate mitigation, in food, in water, in human health. And so through oceans, we can al also address challenges that affect us all, not our planet. You know, that's, a, that's an, uh, an incredible message. I think most of our listeners would have heard at different times uh, about uh, climate, its effects, ocean acidification, and these kinds of, uh, these kinds of things that are talked about. Uh, biodiversity, obviously. Uh, you mentioned human health. Talk more about that link. Yes, so um, the link between ocean health and human health takes different form. And some are uh, related to nutrition and food. Uh, in a recent effort co-led by Stanford Center for Ocean Solution and the Center for Food Security and the Environment here at Stanford in the New Door School, uh, it's called the Blue Food Assessment, studies have shown that uh, aquatic foods the animals and plants uh, that are grown or harvested from aquatic environments, including the oceans, are often very high in nutrient contents. Uh, items like uh, vitamin B12 and omega-3 fatty acid and calcium. First of all, there's a very large diversity of different kinds of aquatic foods, and many of them are incredibly nutritious and accessible to populations that suffer from malnutrition, for example, micronutrient deficiency. So one uh, of the link to health uh, is to nutrition and to the, for the potential to harness aquatic foods to address malnutrition and micronutrient deficiency. However, there's also other links. For example, mental health. Mm. There's now increasing evidence linking access and proximity and the rela relationship with the ocean with mental health. And there are several organizations, for example, uh, the, that are using surfing, you know, aquatic activities, as a way of reconnecting people with nature of promoting physical activity and mental health, particularly in underserved communities. 
So those are you know, some of the links. And then finally, there's uh, a movement to create blue spaces in addition to green spaces, for example, in coastal cities where people can have easy access and enjoy the ocean environment for physical and mental benefits. Oh, wow, that's amazing. And do you think that we're making progress in terms of taking what we've learned and implementing it and turning these into policy initiatives and into actions? Do you think we're kind of on the, on the edge to make more improvements there? Well, the amazing unprecedented window of opportunity is now because this is the decade, the UN decade for ocean science, for sustainability and uh, the Sustainable Development Goals, you know, this global commitment to achieve uh, the planet and humanity that we all want uh, includes now one goal, number 14, which is for healthy ocean. So this is the window of opportunity to ramp up the, the policy and the action to deliver the potentials the oceans can provide you know, for, for planetary stewardship and human well-being. Well, Professor Fiorenza Michele, thank you so much for coming to us. Ingrid, thanks a lot. And thanks to all of you from Stanford University. The Stanford Initiative on Business and Environmental Sustainability podcast series is sponsored by the Stanford Graduate School of Business and the Stanford Door School of Sustainability. Music by Charged Particles. That's Caleb Hutzler, Mike Rock, and John Krosnick.